right. Now we're going to carry on talking about the junctions. Last time, if you've watched the last time, we defined an adjunction, and I'll be honest, we didn't exactly define it like this with the precise wording, but here is the definition of adjunction. An adjunction is given by a pair of functors equipped with specified natural transformations, eta and epsilon on the unit and co-unit, satisfying these two axioms, which are usually known as the triangle identities. Well, because they're triangles. There we are. Now, that's one way of defining an adjunction. Another way of defining an adjunction is the other way around. And what we're later going to do is show that the two definitions are, in fact, equivalent. Now, some people think of this as a definition of junction and think of the other one as some kind of characterization. You can also think of the other one as a definition and think of this one as a characterization, but because they're equivalent. Matter, let's uh, stop waffling for a second. And, only a second. And show something else. Okay, so here's a different definition. Definition two. Uh, and a junction, again with an f left adjunct to g, is given as follows. It's given by a natural isomorphism from, now it's between the morphisms from f of x to y, between these morphisms and the morphisms from x to g of y. Now, where do these morphisms live? f, okay, I forgot to say where my categories and functors were going. It's going like this. So f goes from c to d. So f of x is going to be in d. So these are morphisms in d. These are morphisms in c. And that's a natural isomorphism, which has to be natural in x and y. Now, you're probably thinking several things at this point. One is, this has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the previous definition. Another thing you might be thinking is, what on earth does natural isomorphism mean here? What does natural in x and y mean? Usually you have a natural isomorphism between two functors. I haven't even said what the functors are. So this is, this is a short way that, that um, we sometimes say, talk about natural isomorphisms when we can't be bothered, basically, to say exactly what the functors are, because it can be a bit tedious. But if you look at this carefully, this is actually describing a functor in x, and it's also describing a functor in y. So what are the functors? What are the functors that are, what are the functors that are naturally isomorphic here? Well, there's one that goes from, that takes x and sends it to this set here. Right, so this is, this is in fact a functor, x is an object of c, and so this is a functor from c of to set. And the other one takes x and sends it to this set. So this is a functor from C op to set as well. And since they're both functors from C op to set, it makes perfect sense to ask for them to be naturally isomorphic. And on the other hand... So you fixed the y, though? We fixed the y, yeah. There are actually two natural isomorphisms. That's why I've said natural in x and y. Really, there are two naturality conditions going on here. So the other one is sending y to... Uh, well, let's do this one first, I suppose. To... So here, y is the variable. Um, another way of writing this functor is d of f blank y. That can't possibly be big enough to read what that's seen. Um, and so the other one, this one, is in fact going from d, because y is an object of d, and it's going to set. And this time it's not d op, because the y is on this side of the home thing. And this functor is sometimes known as d of f of x comma blank because that's where the variable is. Um, and so on the other side, we've got the one that takes y and sends it to c, x, g, y, and this is sometimes known as c of x, g blank. So that's where the natural isomorphisms are. Are there any questions about that? Excellent. Now let's see, now that we've, now that we've worked out what the functors are that we're asking to be naturally isomorphic, can we see what the naturality square is going to be. 
I'll leave. Was it unhelpful of me to have brought that off? I don't know. It might have been unhelpful for me, even if it wasn't unhelpful for you. Uh, so one of them is going to say that we've got uh, a morphism for all morphisms f going from x to x prime, say. We've got, on the one hand, this is one possible answer for the functor, and this is another possible answer for the functor. And if you apply this d of f blank y functor to f, what you get, because it's a, it's a functor on the op, you get this thing here. So this is uh, d of f of f comma y. Over here, you get your natural isomorphism that's given by this. Let's call this alpha. So this is alpha. Um, it's a component of alpha anyway. And that takes us over to c of x prime gy. And this takes us down to c of x comma gy. And this is another component of alpha. So what's this actually saying? This is saying, take, coming down here, it's saying, saying take a morphism from f of x prime to y, and somehow produce a morphism from f of x to y using f. And so that what you have to do to do that is you have to compose with f of x. So let's just have a little crib sheet over here. We're starting with a morphism from f of x to y, and we're going to use f of f, um, which, which goes from f of x to f of x primes, and so we're producing a morphism from f of x to y. Hooray! We landed in the right place. You see, you never, know, you never quite know unless you write it out if you're going to write and land in the right place. And so what we've done here is we've pre-composed by f of f. So this function can also be written as, as a blank composed with f of f because what we've done is pre-composed by f of f. And what we've done here, by the same token, is we've pre-composed by f. So this is the naturality square that has to commute. I wonder if I can leave it to the reader to figure out what the other one is, the natural in y. So this is what naturality in x means. Now, I seem to have about two minutes left in which I'm going to give you a hint about what on earth this has to do with the previous definition, where we had a unit and co-unit. Uh, let me get rid of this naturality square. So remember before, what we had was a pair of functors going in opposite directions and an eta and an epsilon. So how can we produce an eta and an epsilon from here? Well, look, let's put y to be f of x. So if we take a morphism from f of x to f of x, which lives inside d of f of x, f of x, this set is supposed to be isomorphic to c from x to g f of y. So this is supposed to produce a morphism from oops, g f of x to g f of x. Right? This isomorphism is a correspondence between morphisms like this and morphisms like this. So what nice morphisms do we have from f of x to f of x? Aha! We have the identity morphism. So if we take the identity morphism, transfer it across this isomorphism to something, we're going to use this to be the component of the unit, e to x. To get the other one, we're going to go backwards and we say, let's put x to be g of, uh, 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 g of y, right? So if we take something from g of y to g of y, which is in c of g y g y, across this isomorphism, it's going to correspond to something in f g y comma y across the isomorphism. So a morphism from f g y to y. What are we going to use here? We're going to use the identity on g of y. And that's going to send us to exactly the right kind of component we want to be a co-unit. So this is going to be called e to y. What we're going to have to do next time is, I can see this clock counting down. Ah! I've only got 30 seconds left. Which means next time we have to show, first of all, that these really are natural transformations. Stop laughing, it's not that funny. And moreover, not only are they natural transformations, but that they satisfy the triangle identities. And that's going to be so much fun that we have to leave until next time.